Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. Today, we're diving into ECG interpretation, focusing on the often overlooked but important aspects of ECG waveforms. While traditional ECG analysis primarily revolves around event detection, there's value in understanding the ECG waveforms themselves. These waveforms provide real-time insight into the electrophysiologic and structural function of the heart. We will explore what makes a normal ECG and a method to classify ECGs as normal or abnormal. We're fortunate to have back with us Dr. Peter Van Dam with us today, and he'll guide us through his research and experience on this topic. Dr. Van Dam has a scientific position at Yagi Lonian University Medical College in Krakow and is the co-founder of ECG Excellence, a Dutch company specialized in developing solutions to make ECG interpretation understandable. Dr. Van Dam started his career at Vitatron which was a Dutch pacemaker manufacturer that was acquired by Medtronic. He left Medtronic in 2009 and started his own company, Peaks. Collaborating with many groups worldwide, he developed various ECG solutions, as well as the recently FDA-cleared Vivo technology. He has worked at UCLA and currently has research collaborations with universities both in the United States and Europe. Dr. Van Dam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, happy to be here back on this show. But well, we're really glad to have you. And, you know, from our conversations, I think there's been a lot of enthusiasm about the work you've been doing. And so maybe we just start with the basics and help us to understand what constitutes a normal ECG waveform, because this is really fundamental. And maybe you can explain how you define what normal is and the methods you've been using in your research to do this. Yeah, thanks um, for this nice introduction. Uh, the the normal ECG with the standard 12 lead ECG is based on the detection of events, basically. So everything on the time axis, onset P wave, onset QRS, is the PR interval normal, is the QRS duration normal, is the QT interval normal. Then there are some global descriptions on amplitudes. There is the ST elevated or depressed baby uh, is the QRS amplitude high low um, T wave positive negative flat peaked but then we have described the whole waveform of the T wave there's way more information in that so the waveform itself is always uh, underestimated in its classification because it's so difficult basically um so in my research, I focused on comparing one single ECG waveform, or actually 12, of course, because we have 12 lead ECG, with a distribution of 6,000 normal ECGs derived from the PTBXL database. Now you can compare, does this waveform fall within a normal waveform distribution? And if it's outside, then you would say, this is probably abnormal. Uh, and this we do way for waveforms and for our technology, scene ECG, the path ECG, the activation path through the 3D heart. Uh, and derived from that, we determine if an ECG is normal or abnormal with very interesting results. All right. Okay. And so what have you found as like the key factors really needed to make an accurate uh, assessment in comparison of the waveform? Um, if, if you normally treat an ECG, you do uh, filtering to get rid of your high, of your baseline wonder due to breathing, electrode uh, potentials. And that's done globally very well. If you have a stable signal, it's close to zero, but it's not accurately, actually 100% zero. Especially for this PATH ECG or the CD ECG, you have to say this is where the activation starts. So I do a hard baseline correction. That means the onset of the QRS, I, that's where I say this is zero. And the end of the T wave, that's also zero. And I 
everything in between, I interpolate to be this line to zero. That's for a lot of ECGs the same, but if you have some baseline wonder, and then you have to determine where is the onset, then it gets difficult. If you have a PVC with 20 milliseconds initial vector, which basically determines where your PVC is coming from, you often lose this in a 12 lead ECG just to, first it's small, but it's also your baseline correction doesn't show it. Uh, it can be even negative due to the filtering. Okay, so you said a couple of things that are interesting. So first, you know, why is, you know, having a good baseline correction so important? And can you elaborate a little bit on how you determine, you know, the onset and end of the, you know, the different waveforms, the P-Wave, QRS, Complex, and T-Wave? Well, basically, I do the same as what every ECG manufacturer does. It determines the onset of the QRS. It determines the end of the T-Wave. But on top of that, I just change also the morphology of the of the waveform by setting this baseline points to zero. The nice thing is you can, if you do this interactively, you very can, can very accurately find the onset of a QRS or of a P wave. Sometimes you see a little hump, and then I have to beat it before that. That's where the electrical the electrical activity starts. And that's what you can do with this baseline correction, way more accurate than this global thing and i've tuned the algorithms to do that correctly and so far that works really well okay. but never in 100 percent of the cases uh, and you could you could expect that i guess i mean so you, you know we tend to see these overlaps between normal and abnormal ecg patterns that can sometimes be difficult to differentiate what is truly abnormal maybe it changes based on the context and the patient uh in that we're dealing with but what are the features that are key for you in differentiating normal versus abnormal? Well, the, the key features are then all the time related to this distribution of waveforms. So if you get outside your uh, waveform distribution or your position, then it tells you somewhere where, in which direction you have to look. So let's go for a an, an left bundle branch block then your QRS is wider, but it also activates from right to left. So you have large amplitudes and uh, uh, negative ones in V1, basically among all the leads. So that differentiates completely from normal because it's outside this normal distribution, which is positive, negative in V1. This is only negative. In the path ECG, it shows that it's going all the way to the left, whereas normally you have a transeptal vector, so it has first go to the right, to the apex, and then to the base. So these differential uh, diagnosis, basically, per signal helps you to classify an ECG as abnormal. So we take every time the delta, where is the signal outside normal? With that, we have in total 10 parameters for the QRS, for the ST segment, and for the T wave, and that for the path and the waveforms. And that has been put into a logistic regression model. And with that, we have tuned to determine if it's normal or abnormal. Okay, so you're essentially using the paths of these different waveforms through the con this conduction system to identify if they're normal or not. And yes. I kind of want to go to, you know, the practical application of all this effort and research you've been putting into. How do you use this method to classify ECGs as normal and abnormal? And, you know, where do you see the key findings in the, the practical application uh, of all this work you've been doing? And the, 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 I think one of the most important um, positive sides of this is, is that you can see why this algorithm thinks it's an abnormal ECG because it tells you, hey, this is where you deviate from normal. So we're always talking about ST elevation and ST depression is missed. But now suddenly you can see that too. And even somebody who cannot read an ECG says, yeah, but the ST is now below the normal distribution. This is ST depression. This is still not normal. Negative T waves are recognized, but some T waves are positive somewhere, although they should be negative. This is easily seen. An, an ischemia that is localized in the 
the distal LAD region is clearly seen in the precordial leads in the ST segment. But if you have an inferior infarct, the ST segment tends to be negative and depressed. This is again visible very easy with these differential signals. So for me, it's I cannot read ECGs very well. But it feels like a little body that helps me to say, hey, you have to look here. And then I'm like, okay, but if it's there, then, then now I understand. This is, a, this is the T wave is different, or this, the ST segment is depressed. That could be ischemia, or it could not be. Or uh, even small deviations in intraventricular conduction delays are, are detected with that. The current a stu a student of mine is studying ACM patients. And they had something like 34 very normal ECGs of family members that were positively tested with some kind of gene defect for ACM. And in 60% of these patients, th this normal distribution tells, hey, this ECG is already deviating. Although the physicians who are really triggered to find abnormal ECGs said this is a normal ECG. So it's even very sensitive. Very fascinating. And like you mentioned, uh, I mean, you could see the value for those that are busy in a clinical setting. And, you know, I, I know you're very good at ECG interpretation, um, but it, for all of us, we get busy and we can always do better. And sometimes there's the opportunity to miss something. And so having a, a tool like this can certainly be helpful, um, not only in the clinical, but also the, the teaching aspect of, of all of this. And um, would you agree yeah. you'd see even a, a a role for education uh, in some of this as well. Uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm at the moment have been developing. Is is really an, the same concept? 3D heart model showing the heart vector over time with this position. So not this normal distribution, but understanding the spatial aspects of the ECG is really something that is key. Um, also for teaching. It, it makes the ECG so much better to understand than just say, if the transition is later in the pregordials, then the PVC comes from here. This is the rules I've heard. Yeah. Very, very. But if you can see what the initial vector does. I really appreciate that. And again, today we really stepped back into the world of ECG interpretation. Could have gone for a lot longer. We focused on the often overlooked but essential aspects of ECG waveforms. We explore the definition of a normal ECG waveform, the path that it conducts through the conduction system, and how you know Peter's been able to look at that and identify normal and abnormal patterns. As we wrap up this episode, it's evident that understanding ECG waveforms is important for providing real-time insights into cardiac electrophysiology, and there's so much learning for us to do. A sincere thank you to Dr. Van Dam for joining us and sharing his research and experience. I hope they'll join us again. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to a Mayo Clinic cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in every other week to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic. This has been a Mayo Clinic podcast.